Um, my name is David Malcolm. Um, I work at Red Hat on GCC, and this first session is going to be about what's new in GCC in the Dash F Analyzer option. Uh, I assume everyone can hear me and can see the slides. Um, and so, where are we? Next slide. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what is the Dash F Analyzer option, uh, how it works internally, uh, what I've been, what the changes I've made so far for GCC 12 and the changes I'm hoping to still make for GCC 12 before feature freeze, which is pr probably um, early November this year. So what is Dash F Analyzer? It's a static analysis option. Uh, the command line option enables a new interprocedural pass, which I added in GCC 10, and it uh, does a much more expensive analysis of the user's code than we've traditionally done for warnings in GCC. Um, internally, it tries to walk the, or attempts to walk all the paths through the user's source code and builds what's called an exploded graph, which is a director graph that combines both control flow information and program state. So each node in this director graph has both a program point, which is a combination of the control flow like a location in the control flow graph, but also into procedural information, a call stack. And it also has a state. The program state's a bit more involved. It has um, a, um, the first th the first bullet point is a, what we call it the store, which is a abstract representation of the contents of memory. It's a mapping between uh, symbolic descriptions of memory regions and symbolic um, values that those memory regions can hold. So for example, a particular, it might represent that a particular global variable has a particular constant value. We also store constraints on those symbolic values. Uh, so for example, we might know that at this point on the execution path, the initial value of parameter i of, the, of a function is less than the initial value of parameter m of the function. As well as uh, the tracking memory contents and constraints, we have uh, some state machines. So for example, that uh, the tracking heap APIs, we might know that a particular pointer has had three called on it. Um, and uh, another state machine example is a taint state machine. This one's much less, uh, this one's more, more of a proof of concept still at this stage, where we track that a particular value has come from an um, a untrustworthy source and hasn't yet been sanitized so that we can complain, for example, if it gets used at a, as an array index. And those state machines both track states per value, but um, the, uh, and I'm seeing people talk on IRC, uh, but other other um, other state machines can be just global. So we have a state machine that's just one big flag saying, "Are oh, we within a signal handler at this point in execution?" And um, the analyzer attempts to explore all interesting paths through the user's code. Uh, I have various heuristics for for doing so, uh, but because we're just tracking an approximation of state. And because we want to ensure that the analysis terminates in a reasonable time, and indeed terminates, there are various ways in which we can have false positives where we complain about things we shouldn't do, and false negatives where we fail to complain about things that we should have done. So the analysis is neither complete nor sound, to use the jargon. Um, as we explore the user's code and build this um, exploded graph, we, we store diagnostics into it. And the, the reason we don't emit, emit them immediately is because once we've explored the code, we can do deduplication and we can try and find some nodes are really effectively the same diagnostic. So some diagnostics are effectively the same diagnostic as another. And we try and find the simplest one that we can emit to the user. Um, and we, as we find the, the simplest path through the graph, we try and find the simplest feasible path through the graph. So that if we check a flag is like if foo, but we also want to make sure that foo is still true on later edges in that path. So we don't, and that's another way of rejecting certain false positives. And finally, having done that, we express the simplest version of each diagnostic to the user um, using ASCII art to express the, the path through the code. So in the initial implementation of this in GCC 10, I added 15 new warnings. Um, the first uh, few, the, the, the motivating case was uh, the double free detection, and there are a few others relating to it using the heat state machine, use after free as a leak detection, uh, and various others, uh, similarly for the file API. Um, I was a, one, of the, one of the nice things about the uh, exploded graph representation is it makes it 
relatively easy to implement set jump and long jump support. So there's a couple of warnings about that. Uh, there's the signal handler one where we can check interprocedurally, are we in a signal handler and complain if someone calls a function that's known to be unsafe to call from a signal handler. Uh, there's the taint thing, which is unfortunately still a proof of concept at this stage. And a, a, a final one is a attempt to detect um, if passwords get written out to a log file. Again, still a proof of concept at this stage. The GCC 11, we, well, one thing we did was we generalized the uh, GCC's existing malloc attribute, uh, which used to merely be a way to hint to the optimizer that this pointer it doesn't have aliases, it's a freshly allocated heap pointer. But uh, we, we added a, an optional second parameter, which is what's the free function for this allocator. And, and once you have that, well, the analyzer could complain if it sees a mismatching deallocator. Um, and it also just marks the analyzer, this is an allocator deallocate a pair, and it means it can do double free, leak, and all those other detections on a custom allocator. And I also had a few, uh, well, a couple of um, warnings about un um, undefined shifts, uh, undefined behaviors and shifts, and undefined behaviors due to attempting to write to something that's read only. Uh, also for GCC 11, I added some initial plugin support, the ability for a plugin to register its own state machine. And the example that's in the test suite, uh, CPython, the, uh, the Python API, has um, uh, allows you to um, embed a Python interpreter inside an application or to wrap libraries with Python as Python extension modules. And the API has a one big global mutex, the global interpreter lock, where all access to that API and all access to Python objects have to be guarded with this mutex. So I wrote a simple plugin in which, um, and here's an example where some code has uh, done pi begin allow threads to release that lock. Maybe it wants to do some uh, wait on some I/O or do some expensive computation, and then it tries to manipulate a reference count, and the analyzer correctly complains that yeah, you can't do that. You need the lock in order to do that. So back in the spring, I was looking at what what should I focus on for GCC 12? And I had initially thought I would look at C++ support, um, but I felt that what I really wanted to do was try and improve um, the analyzer support for C. And, and I looked at a few different areas, and I'll talk in the next few slides about uh, what I looked at. So I implemented, I had implemented new delete new and delete support for C++ in GCC 11, but I hadn't implemented exception handling support. And, um, and, and I looked briefly at it, and it's quite, it's a, it's quite involved. And, uh, and I was thinking, well, maybe I'll get back to that. Um, in the meantime, I'm, I mentored this summer, a summer of code student, Anka Saini. I, forgive me if I'm pleased if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and he did a lot of work generalizing how the analyzer handles uh, jumps through function pointers and use that to implement support for virtual functions for C++. But what we still don't have is support for exception handling or for uh, runtime type identification. That's uh, C++ is dynamic casts. And so, um, and that's, well, it'd be an interesting, uh, if, if someone wants to volunteer, it's a, it's a, a well-defined area that they could step into and, and work on for the analyzer. But I had decided what I really wanted to focus on was Improve, there's still a lot of um, C uh, areas that we could support better. And, um, and so I thought, I'd be, let's focus on doing that well, rather than uh, you know, attempting to, to branch out into C++. And uh, next slide. Yeah, so I thought there would be a couple of areas I could look at for better C support. One would be buffer overflow detection. That's a really important issue for C. The other would be um, detecting uses of uninitialized values. Uh, we already have that in GCC, but this, because it's using the, the analyzer's infrastructure, would be a, a path sensitive analysis of um, the, an in procedural analysis of uninitialized values. So we did some prototyping back in the spring of trying to implement buffer overflow detection in the analyzer. Now, um, some of that work, or some of the sort of the enabling work for that is in trunk right now. Uh, so for example, uh, I, a few slides ago, I showed the sort of state that I'm capturing at each, for, in each node in the, in the analysis. And that state I now capture uh, the sizes of dynamic allocations. So, and the, these are captured symbolically. So if you have some code that says, 
p equals malloc size of or sort of n times size of something plus size of something else then that will actually get captured as a symbolic expression in the in the program state um, and I, the other thing i added was a consistent place in the analyzer for tracking here is here are places here's all memory accesses all reads and writes that the program does here's a place to 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 uh, to, to put uh, checks there uh, so that we can add diagnostics. So the logical thing to do would be then to try and add a buffer overflow detection check at that uh, sort of checkpoint um, using the uh, the size information that I put in. So I tried doing that and I tried categorizing all memory accesses sort of into three categories which is one is like we know this is a valid access all is good or we know that this is definitely invalid or at least partially invalid and that we should complain about but also the we don't know uh, the analyzer just doesn't have enough information at this point uh, and i i took it i took it as far as creating the sort of boolean symbolic expression of that describes this memory access is known to be fully valid and then evaluate it and it's a try state we have a it's known to be true it's known to be false, so we know there's at least some part of the bounds that we're, we're, we've gone by beyond. Or, and by far the most common case, the unknown. And so my prototype was emitting like hundreds of possible out of bounds right to array index i when i is greater than or equal to n or i is less than zero. And I'd be looking at them going, well, yeah, that's how array accesses in C work. This is not useful information and I thought well this is it's just a wall of noise it's not particularly useful to a to a user um, I thought well how can I make it useful and I had the idea well actually there's a fourth category which is um, can an attacker influence one of the sub expressions within this is this memory access valid exp um, condition and if so well that's really important information to the programmer um, so it kind of got me thinking about well I have this prototype of taint detection I let's let's pursue that and it got me thinking well what are the values can we can we decide for arbitrary C code what are the values that are trusted and we don't and, and are known to be okay are this what are the values that are untrusted that need sanitization that we should take great care about what's the attack surface of the code what are those trust boundaries can we decide that for rig for arbitrary c code i think the answer is no but there are important projects that um and ways that we could annotate those projects that um for which we could basically identify that trust boundary and i thought well the linux kernel is very important to red hat it's important to a lot of the attendees at this linux plumbers conference and, um, and so having a way of annotating that boundary between uh, user space and kernel space seems like really a fruitful thing to explore we have in in linux has a copy from user copy to user to express going across that user space kernel space boundary and there are system calls which are uh, where the parameters and the arguments coming in through system calls um, could be hostile and similarly ioctals um, data coming from the network uh, and so forth or from usb devices and so i did some experimentation with can we mark up the kernel source code um, in a reasonably lightweight way to, to try and identify that boundary between user space and kernel space uh, so, for example, um, GCC already has uh, one of its attributes. It has an attribute access, which can be read-only, write-only, read-write, I think. And it basically lets you express wh what direction data is flowing in on a particular, um, for a particular um, pointer in a parameter to a function. So I tried introducing, well, an untrusted read and untrusted write. So, for example, for copy to user, you have data that's inside the kernel being copied back to user space. And if you have, say, an un uninitialized stuff on the stack that's being copied back to user space, or maybe whatever was in there, um, it could be um, sensitive information that's getting leaked back to some process in user space that might be running as a different user to whatever call the, the system called before. Um, and so we can, maybe we can annotate with an untrusted write that that's going, you know, that we could have a, a, a information leak there. Similarly, for copy from user, we could maybe have an attribute to mark that up as an untrusted read so that the analyzer can know that values coming across that boundary, this is a trust boundary, and values coming across it need, um, need special care. Um, one nice thing about the kernel headers is that there's a single um, 
macro, um, well, there are a lot of macros, but there's a single place where we can add a, I tried an attribute tainted, which I invented, and it basically says, well, um, any any uh, actually, any arguments to this function, don't trust them. And, and by putting them in this particular macro, suddenly all of the system call implementations across the whole kernel get marked with this attribute. Um, and, and, and which is really nice because it seems that users hate having to add attributes to their declarations. And if you have to do it in dozens and dozens of places, um, that's kind of going to be a non-starter. Whereas if it's like just a one single place and you've got like a hopefully five, six line patch to the kernel, that's much a much easier um, ask. Sorry, that's a management jargon. That's a, that's much easier to patch to get in. I hope. Um, similarly, um, there are a lot of places in the kernel which use we have callbacks where uh, uh, functions are registered in tables of callbacks, and I was able to add an attribute to the field declaration. So here's one for configfs where where data is being stored, but there's a similar one for ioctals where we can mark that field with an attribute and then the analyzer can see any function that gets used as sort of registered as a callback for that field we can then mark that function as being um, we know that it's getting stuff from say it's an ioctal handler or it's handling network data we know those values need extra care and again it's just like one place and or then all of the ioctal handlers in the kernel get marked with that attribute so i started looking at his an old Linux kernel vulnerabilities, and and I found there were two general categories of vulnerability that looked quite fruitful to to try and detect in the analyzer. One is information leaks, where as I said, if you have uninitialized data, gets copied back from the kernel into user space, and that might leak inf information, for example, just where the what the layout of the kernel memory is, which gets randomized, but an attacker, if the attacker knows where certain things are, are stored, that gives them information to make another attack more useful. Um, it's relatively easy to, te to detect, or at least I thought it was going to be, so I thought I'd look at this first. To, I'm, I'm something of a kernel newbie, so I thought I would get my feet wet with, with this. Um, historically, it's been regarded by some as re rather low severity, and um, just debatable. Uh, and also, uh, a marvelous thing in GCC 12, we have they have a mitigation for it. We have a new dash f trivial auto var init option, uh, which will uh, mitigate a lot of these problems. But of course, the same source code could be, be being compiled by uh, by other people with an older compiler. So it's good to get the source code itself fixed. Um, so it's good to detect these. Um, and the other issue I was looking at is taint, where yeah, um, if data is coming from the user space or the network or even a hostile USB device, and the, that data is being used for, say, an array index or the size of an allocation or even a, as a divisor. So it's on the attack, it can inject the divide by zero. And um, this seems harder to detect. So I, I have a prototype of it as of GCC 10, but it's turned off by default because of scalability issues. And it seems relatively higher importance because you can crash the kernel or you can get root using these kinds of attacks. So um, looking at those, here's an historical, here's uh, an info leak from four years ago. It's a AAC SRB reply struct with a, a bunch of fields in it. And, um, and the code, uh, hopefully this is visible, is um, we basically, we make one of these on the stack, we initialize all the fields, in fact, and then we have a copy to user to copy all the values um, back to the user so they, they can get the data. Now, and, and the analyzer successfully reports correctly that there's a uh, information leak here with a rather verbose potential exposure of sensitive information by copying uninitialized data from stack across trust boundary, um, exposure through uninit copy, and it shows um, the source region of the copy is created on the stack here. So it identifies whether it's on the stack or on the heap and how big it is. It's 52 bytes. Um, and a copy happens here. And you might wonder, well, we initialized all the fields. What's the problem? And it says, well, two bytes are uninitialized. And it says, well, there's two, two bytes of padding after the final field. Um, that get uninitialized, and I, I've got the wording. The, the warning is worded so that it tries to identify all the different fields, uh, padding areas, and that are either uninitialized, fully uninitialized, or partially uninitialized. And I track it at the per bit level um, 
by paths and into procedurally. And it also would actually gener generate a fix-it hint, uh, suggesting to initialize the, uh, the, the, the object on the stack, which can be, from which you can, GCC can auto generate a patch. Um, and so I was looking and thinking, well, it's, I want, I had a, I want to have an analyzer use of uninitialized value um, a warning that was in the old patch kit that I uh, originally submitted for GCC 10 to drop it because it was, um, it wasn't very well implemented. And so I decided, well, now is the right time to implement it. So I had to do a fairly large amount of hacking to the store. That's the how we track abstract the the abstract description of what's in memory. Um, I, I'd already had to do a big rewrite for GCC 11, so I had a somewhat large rewrite for GCC 12 as well, and also how bit fields are handled. Uh, but now at least we track at the per bit level what's been initialized or not, and uh, which is of course important and allows us to do this more general warning as well for C code. I also found I had a big, big bug in how switch states and what statements were handled, so uh, that needed a, a fairly large amount of work as well. Uh, another ex example here, there's a bug in this code where you have a field um, on, the, on the stack so an object on the stack, we, we copy from user to it, we do some stuff with it, then we copy to user to a different pointer. And there's a bug in this code because if the copy from user fails and leaves this untouched, it's uninitialized, and then we have, if the copy to user succeed, copy to user succeeds, you have an info leak of you know how many bytes that is. And um, and in order to detect that, I found I, I there was a problem in the analyzer where I sort of all my state updates are done in place. And I did that because basically as an optimization because we weren't using C++11 when I was first working on the analyzer. And uh, unfortunately, that's rather baked in rather too deeply now. Uh, so it means that um, every control flow edge, there's like, it, it, it seems there's a single output, a single possible uh, outcome for it. And so I had to add in some special casing for the rare case where you want to split the analysis, or I use the jargon, bifurcate the analysis. Um, so I can do a when the copy from user succeeds and copy from user fails and basically split the analysis at each copy from user call. And that's in trunk now um, with special handling for realloc where we want the three outcomes of growing, growing the thing in place, having to remove the allocation or just failing. So taint detection. Um, here's an example uh, from 10 years ago where we have, I've, I've omitted a whole bunch of stuff um, of fields, but basically you have a slot integer and there's a pair of slots. This gets copied to the, to the stack from user space. We grab a pointer to it. We do this bit of sanitization and then we use this to you do an, look up an array index. Um, at, and an array elsewhere in the kernel. Uh, oh, sorry, we, we don't just look it up, we write to it. Um, and this is a bug because, I don't know if anyone can see it, but well then if you do, because um, int is signed. And so although we validated that it's not beyond that two, it could be negative, at which point this write is an arbitrary write to somewhere in memory, um, the, the, the controlled by user space. Um, and, uh, and so the analyzer, my, my prototype of the analyzer successfully compl complains about this. Use of attacker controlled value info um, in array lookup without checking for negative. And it shows the, the path to get to that. Um, and, um, and so I've been working on a prototype of this and I've got lots of unit tests of lots of reduced kernel code. And I thought, well, what, um, but unfortunately the Linux headers are really complicated. They've got lots of conditionals in them. And so I've, I've got an integration test, I what I like to call the world's worst kernel module, antipatterns.ko on my GitHub, and in which I try and make as many mistakes as possible. And, and, and I can verify that my patched analyzer does detect this on the, with the Fedora kernel headers. Another issue I ran into when trying to scale this up onto the real kernel with real headers is the Linux uses a lot of inline assembler. So I had to add some primitive support to, um, to the analyzer for um, you know, five minutes, thanks, um, for handling um, inline assembler. Um, what I don't do is look at the actual opcodes themselves because that would just be a huge scope creep. Uh, I have some heuristics which effectively suppress a lot of false positives. Now. Um, and I scripted basically grabbing my patch analyzer code 
um, building that and then using that to build the kernel. And I've been running it on recent Fedora and RHEL and upstream kernels and uh, fixing the various false positives that I ran into and uh, reporting the one true positive that it finds um, in a all yes config upstream kernel of uh, some code that we don't build in our distribution kernels and that and that isn't yet fixed and is uh, and not yet public and therefore one the reason why the basically all in terms of upstreaming this all of my all of the support code is in gcc trunk but the kernel specific tests are still just in an internal red hat repo because it finds vulnerabilities in kernel, the kernel, which is at least one, which um, I don't want to, you know, hey, here's a tool to find zero days until a kernel community has, has a chance to fix them. So in trunk, we have the new use of uninitialized value um, into procedural and, you know, per bit um, and path aware version of uninitialized warnings. Um, and a whole bunch of other cleanups and, and infrastructure needed by InfoLeak and the taint detection that also helps all C code. And so the InfoLeak detection, as I say, isn't yet itself in trunk, uh, but it, it's basically done um, technically uh, sort of an implementation point of view um, and is basically ready to go in, but I don't want it to go in because it, as I say, there, there, it would be a zero day. Um, and um, the, but there's some sort of, we can have a bike shed painting discussion about what should the syntax for the attributes look like and also where should this code live like can I express every, all the semantics I need to about the kernel um, in a, generally enough that it isn't kernel specific or is, there, is this inherently kernel specific and therefore should it should be a plugin or something the taint detection is I'm still working on the implementation um, there's still bugs and misses stuff and there's some state explosion but I hope to have it done by the close of stage one and similar scope considerations apply as for info leak detection um, so I've spoken about the analyzer how it works internally the various changes I've made to GCC 12 for um, which benefit all C handling, especially the, the, the better uninitialized value detection, this new uninitialized value detection, and the, and the warnings are, that are very much kernel specific relating to that user space, kernel space boundary. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, thanks to LPC for, for hosting us. Uh, the project's homepage is on the GCC wiki at the link on this slide. Uh, also, I'm co-running with uh, Carlos O'Donnell a session on this at the Kernel Dependability and Assurance mini conference on Thursday. And I'm pretty much out of time, but if anyone has any questions, I guess, well, I mean, I guess you can ask them on Thursday and we can have a discussion about it there, because I think the next session is starting in a couple of minutes. Uh, th thank you, David. Yes, we, you've got a couple of minutes of, of questions, and like I say, there's plenty of vehicles for uh, asking questions um, uh, throughout the meeting. Um, um, uh, so while any questions come through to David, um, and there were a couple of questions I see from Richard Beener in the chat. Um, uh, uh, Christoph and Eric and Philip are up next. I guess, Eric, are you doing the presenting? Yes, I will be doing the presenting. Okay, so... Um, I, just, uh, I, I, I can't see the chat. It's been syncing for the last 40 minutes. Well, there's been a spinny thing in the uh, chat. So any uh, if you could repeat the question, please. Are there a publicly available test suites for static and an analyzers? It must be an active research topic after all. Are there, um, there is a test suite. I think it originally came from it was one of the uh, car companies. I think it may have been Toyota. Um, I think it's the um, the NIST, NIST, or the Samate, uh, S-A-M-A-T-E. And I can um, maybe post links um, for that. Um, and yeah, so there, are, there, there, there is a public. Um, it's like here's a set of uh, you know sort of benchmarks, as it were, for do you detect this? Do you uh, probably not emit a false positive on that? Um, and I've played around with those, uh, but I haven't yet managed to integrate it into my test suite. Okay, thank you very much, David. Always good mm -hmm. to hear from thanks, you. Thanks, thanks um, for listening. Uh, so um, our next talk is from. Uh, uh, Eric Okawa, uh, Christoph Munga, and Philip Tomish. And I think Eric, you're doing the actual presenting, and I think you're just going to share your slides. Is that correct? Yes, I will share my slides in a second. Just one moment. Um...
Oops. I should have said to speakers who ha haven't seen the, ver the various emails because there's been a lot of advice to speakers, you will get a little card flash up to warn you you've got five minutes left and then one minute left. And when time okay. runs out, I shall step in. Okay. Uh, it's almost finished uploading, uh, but I uploaded a PDF named points to dot PDF. And uh, I there you think, are. yeah, perfect. All right. All well, yours. Thank you. Thanks. Um, all right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Eric, and I'm here to present the work that me, Christoph, and Philip have been doing for the last uh, year and a half. And it involves some technologies, uh, some uh, um, um, so, sorry, um, some yes, some new technologies and some work that we did in the past that we've already presented on the patches mailing list. Uh, so let's start. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like to start by introducing Suflam. And I'm going to be using some of the resources available on their website. And so I've included the link of the website below. Uh, but Suflam is, as GCC, it's a compiler. And it compiles a data log language down to C++. And so what does this language look like? Uh, Souffle is a declarative logic language. And as such, instead of functions, it has relations. And um, in this simple program that we're going to be building, it, uh, we are going to be receiving as an input uh, edge list to describe a graph. And we're going to be um, making the output a uh, list of tuples for all nodes in the graph that can um, that uh, have a path between them. And so here we're just declaring the edge. Um, the nodes are represented as numbers. Um, so if there's an edge between nodes X and Y, then there's going to be a tuple uh, in this relation. Um, the, there are two different kinds of relations that can be um, described in Souffle. Uh, one of them is the input relation, because we're going to be receiving this as an input, either as a, a comma-separated value list, uh, sorry, value file, or um, also you can interface via C++ to uh, send input to the Souffle program. Now we are declaring the path uh, relation. Again, um, the path relation will contain a tuple if there's a path between nodes X and Y. And we're going to be declaring it as an output path. Um, but now we still need to build the rules that will um, actually uh, specify what path means, right? And so here, one of the first rules is uh, almost axiomatically um, there's uh, if there's an edge x and y, then there's a path uh, between x and y. And we read these rules from left to right, um, again, saying that if there's an edge, then there's a path. And, uh, but that's not all. We also need to compute the transitive closure to make sure that all the edges that are connected are also part of the path. And so here we say um, that if there's a path x set and an edge set y, then there's also a path x, y. Uh, cool. So that's a very brief description of the data log language. And I invite you to read uh, more on Souffle. Uh, and I'm going to be describing a little bit of the material in one of the papers, one of the first papers that uh, describes Souffle. And here, I want to mention the, uh, some of the optimizations that happen in Souffle. Um, first, it starts with a data log uh, program. Uh, there are some high-level optimizations that are done in the declarative language. And then 
it gets converted into a relational algebra machine that is uh, described in an imperative uh, language. And there are also some optimizations performed there. And uh, finally, there's some C++ code that gets generated, which if we wanted, we could compile down to uh, binary. Uh, however, we're going to be more interested in looking only at the C++ output, and so uh, ignore uh, compiling down to a binary for now. All right, so we already described uh, what souffle is, but why are we talking about souffle? Why do we think it's interesting? Uh, well, data log is a language that is well suited for program analysis. Um, so in particular, um, it is if you restrict yourself to a subset of the language, it is not Turing complete and it's guaranteed to terminate. And so uh, it is a nice property to know that uh, program analysis will terminate uh, or programs in general will terminate. Uh, the second thing is that it manages its own memory within that section of the program. So you feed some input and you don't have to worry about memory management anymore, uh, not even after receiving an output. So I think that's very neat. Um, also, um, the C++ that is generated uh, via Souffle uh, can take advantage of parallelism via OpenMP. So the C++ is annotated with OpenMP pragmas. So if you have access to uh, many cores, then um, and your program analysis is written in such a way that can take advantage of parallelism, then uh, this is an incredible opportunity. Uh, you can also have uh, some features such as provenance and profiling, which aid in the debugging of uh, program analysis. So provenance essentially creates a proof that shows you why the output relation exists given the input relations and profiling, well, it's just profiling for souffle. And finally, it is a high level language in which uh, I believe all data flow problems can be expressed. And since a lot of compiler problems or data flow problems, uh, it seems like uh, Souffle is uh, a useful tool for program analysis writers. All right, so um, again, we, we know what Souffle is now and uh, we know what, why it's interesting. The question is, can Souffle programs be part of the GCC build process? And of course, the answer is gonna be yes, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, uh, but let's go a little bit more into the details. Uh, so here's another figure on the same paper that I shared before. And it describes the flow of inputs into the data log engine. But I'm going to be modifying this uh, graph to make it more um, concrete uh, when talking about GCC and how it can be, how we can integrate Souffle into GCC. So, First, of course, we start with an input program. Um, in our case, it could be the C++, C++ uh, or more likely the GIMPL representation of the program that we're trying to compile. Uh, then we, this program needs to go through an extractor, which will generate the input relations. Um, and in this case, it will be a GCC pass, just as any other GCC pass, uh, which might be of interest. And it generates some input relations. And um, as stated in the original graph, uh, we still need to make the program analysis and somehow uh, feed it to a data log engine. And just to make it a little bit more concrete here, yes, uh, we're gonna write our program analysis in data log, and we're gonna feed our program analysis to Souffle, which will generate a C++ file. And then we can use the Souffle uh, C++ interface in the GCC pass to feed the input relations to the Souffle program, to our analysis, and receive the, the outputs from the analysis itself back in the GCC pass. So um, there are some trade-offs. Uh, there are some trade-offs. Uh, Souffle um, C++ code is C++ 17. And so you need a compiler 
or modifying the, um, you, you either need a compiler that by default compiles C++17 or modify the build process accordingly. Uh, you also need to modify the, the uh, build process to allow for the F permissive flag. Uh, if you want to take advantage of OpenMP, you can compile with OpenMP. And finally, you need to allow for exceptions to happen. And so, okay, now we know uh, how we can run program analysis written in Souffle uh, from the DIN GCC. The question is, well, why would we want to do this? And uh, we have our motivation, which is um, we are building a points to analysis at link time, uh, and we're building it in Souffle. And it's no secret that uh, there is one benchmark in the spec benchmarking suite, MCF, that um, we uh, are interested in uh, optimizing. So uh, in particular, there's, um, there's two structs of interest. There's the struct arc and the struct node. And if we perform some data layout optimizations on them, and we have already implemented a version of these optimizations in the past, uh, those are dead field elimination and field reordering. Uh, we can reduce the size um, of these structures and also uh, improve the memory utilization of the program. So let's uh, take a quicker look. So here, uh, it doesn't look as good, but there, there are some arrows that are pointing to the fields that are going to be deleted, the next out and next in, in the case of the arc. And for the case of the node struct, we're going to delete the arc temp. And then we reorder them. And after that, uh, the size of these structs get reduced from 72 and 104 down to 56 and 96 in a 64 bit architecture. And you might think, well, like, what does that uh, give us, right? And so um, in uh, machines with many cores which are hungry for memory, uh, we can see that this optimization does perform more well and scales well with the number of cores. Uh, here, you can read the x-axis as the number of cores where the benchmark was run, and the y-axis is the normalized MCF score, where the uh, denominator is the score where the optimization was not enabled, and um, uh, uh, what? And the um, denominator, <laughs> and the other one is the the the. Uh, the score with the transformation enabled. So essentially everything above one is good, everything below one is bad. Uh, now, as I mentioned, we've already implemented this in the past, uh, but it was not what the community wanted and it's not what the community needed, and we agree with this. Um, so we implemented the legality analysis uh, using a type escape analysis, which is very coarse and can only be applied to all instances of a given type. And what we want to do is to do uh, re-implement the legality analysis using the points to analysis that can be applied at an alias level granularity. Um, so if there are any questions, I cannot see the, um, the what, the uh, chat, so I, I would have to switch slides, but anyhow. Um, uh, we can we can ask questions uh, later. Um, for the majority of the current implementation, actually fits on this slide. But again, this implementation is less precise than the current points to analysis in GCC. The implementation that we are uh, currently uh, that we currently have uh, is field insensitive and intra procedural, so it only works within one single function. Uh, but you can see how, like, it's a more concise implementation. Um, uh, it's a very concise implementation. And so here, for example, I'm just going to go over three rules on how to um, interpret this. So here we see up, uh, that the points to is a tuple between a pointer and a pointy. And it will, it, this relationship will exist whenever we have a, um, pointer and a pointy, um, and the A is the address of operator. So uh, 
Um, so here, for example, PA just states that uh, the left-hand side is a plane variable and the right-hand side is an address of expression. So pointer pointing. Um, then we also would need to implement the case where one pointer is copied into another. And so here, the, these are both plain variables. Uh, I'm following a very uh, familiar and um, pretty much similar to implementation of the one in GCC. So this might be familiar to some. Um, and so the idea is that, well, if you have a pointy uh, that is being pointed by temp, uh, then, um, then what? Uh, then pointer is actually pointing to point T because we propagate uh, this information down to uh, the point T. And uh, we also have uh, support for uh, the reference. Uh, S here means star. So here in this case, uh, we have a PS stands for plane and star. So uh, left and temp. And um, if points to uh, temp um, points to, if temp points to right, such as this case, then uh, what we're going to do is basically we are creating this new virtual statement left equals right, uh, which will get solved by some other rule later on. And so again, this is the majority of the current implementation. There are some details that I've left uh, behind, such as the gathering of the constraints and some um, clean up uh, of them. Uh, but what I want you all to, um, I don't know, get from this uh, talk is that I think that Souffle is an exciting possible new direction for program analysis. Uh, and that there, of course, needs to be some dialogue about the possibility of integrating Souffle uh, with GCC's code base. And we're currently working on a points to analysis to resolve some concerns on our previous uh, data layout optimi uh, optimization implementation. And uh, we've consulted some uh, work uh, done by others on data layout optimization and points to analysis. And in particular, we're very interested in uh, the form of paper and in the structure sensitive points to analysis. That's kind of what we want to bring into uh, GCC. And so if you have any questions, uh, do let me know uh, here. Uh, now I have time to check the um, the chat on my other uh, uh, tab. So I'll take a look at that. Uh, and I also have some materials for some questions uh, if those questions are going to come up. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Let's see. Um, cool. Um, so anyhow, uh, I don't know if people want to raise hands or how does this work, but uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard, raise your hand. hand. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard, uh, yeah, uh, so, raise your hand. Okay, so uh, I have a question. And yes. so the, the, the Souffle generated code, is that only used during build time of GCC, or is that like generated each time you compile a program with the analysis? It's only, um, so we only generate the C code once, and like it lives as a, as a part of GCC. It, it, as long as you don't change the analysis, you don't need to recompile data log into C++. Okay. Uh, and there was a question from Thomas Rogers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Thomas, either unmute and ask your question or type it in the chat. If you would. Again, I cannot really see the chat uh, on this window, so I have to uh, switch my windows. I can read out any questions about there. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that, that may have been an accident. The, the hand's gone down anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, any other questions to ask your general questions. Um, I'm not going to start talks, talks early, even if people are here, because 
we um, we don't know who's waiting from other channels for those. So now is your opportunity to ask questions on all ranges or raise other subjects. Well, if there's anyone, like if there's a particular question here, uh, we can go over it. I have prepared some material there too. <laughs> but um, um, I don't know. Um, Actually, could I ask how uh, Souffle compares to Prologue? Um, well, I, I'm not an expert in Souffle and I'm not an expert in Prologue, uh, but Prologue, uh, my uh, like basic knowledge is that it's uh, interpreted uh, I guess, well, it's a language, so the, I guess that the fault in the, the implementation that I know of is interpreted and Souffle um, like compiles down um, uh, this data log to, to C++. Uh, but maybe talking more about language features, um, Souffle and data log in general, uh, I, uh, in general, they disallow the cut operator and um, uh, so that's one of the reasons why I think uh, Souffle is able to be non-Turing complete or it's non-Turing complete. And, like, and again, uh, it might not be the only reason why Souffle and Datalog is not Turing complete, but I think um, the uh, cut operator would um, introduce some uh, Turing completeness, not 100% sure. Any any other question, or does that answer fully your question? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in in Prolog either, so, <laughs> but I had some experience with it many mm -hmm. years ago. Okay. okay. Cool. Well, uh, I don't know if there's not any. Uh, I'm happy to receive uh, questions uh, on my email, and I'll forward them to my collaborators. And um, is, is there, an, if I may, is, so is there an, this is David Malcolm, is there an analogy, I guess, between you, we have, let's say, Lex and Yak for doing like grammar generators and we, the code would live, the generated dot C code typically lives in the source tree. So it's the idea that this is a way of describing a data flow problem and then, or, or a, a graph solving problem or whatever, that, and then the generated code again could live in the GCC source tree. Yes, uh, that is basically what you're proposing. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so it's basically that. And um, what I, again, what I'd really like to not necessarily stress, but one thing that I like is that, um, well, writing data log is a lot easier than writing uh, C. And so if you really want to just experiment, then it's just easy to uh, pop into data log, change some things, and then uh, have it have the implementation change in that regard. Of course, it's not going to be magic and that's not necessarily the only thing that you're going to do because there might still be some work that needs to be done on the C++ side, like generating constraints. Uh, but um, I think that these alleviates um, some of the work that um, compiler people and program analysis writers um, often, often have, so yeah. Thanks. No worries.